Edgar Perez. Alkışlarınızla sahneye geliyor. Edgar, welcome. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. What an honor to address such a beautiful crowd. Thank you very much for joining me this early in the morning. We're going to talk today about the past, the present, and more importantly, the future. A future that is coming to us at fast speeds. A future that we might not be prepared for. Yet, the fact that we are all today trying to learn, trying to continue innovating, means that we're getting ready for that. Not so long ago, 40 years ago, in fact, there was no internet. We still had information available in universities, investigation centers, yet that information was not easily accessible. It was only through the interconnection of these different universities at first that the information became available for people to collaborate. I remember meeting a professional back then who had an email that didn't have the normal characters that we see today in email addresses. That was back in the day. Now, we cannot live without accessing the internet pretty much any second. Today, 2.5 billion people access Facebook. Back in 2003, I was finishing my MBA at Columbia. And it was a very interesting proposition, a new website that allowed you to connect with people from other schools at the beginning, and then later on with people in high school, and then with everybody. And today, billions of people need to be connected through Facebook. Equally, TikTok. One billion people using TikTok, creators, consumers. And they all like these features, because TikTok is already using artificial intelligence to try to get to know you, to understand what you like, to understand your preferences. And based on that, TikTok is able to deliver a customized experience. Now, AI, artificial intelligence, what we know today, is a field that has been going through ups and downs. Even back in the day, 1954, when these professors got together at Dartmouth University and coined this term, artificial intelligence, we always dream of a level of understanding by computers similar to human intellect. Today, we talk about generative AI, a new field, the capability for machines to come up with new images, new pictures, new texts, new videos, new protein structures. And this capability, it's a step ahead. It is definitely providing new avenues for us to interact with society. For example, today, we are used to use AI across different devices, across different applications. All of us use a smartphone, and your smartphone is using AI today to save battery, so you don't have to be chasing a charger when you're running out of power. Now, these developments didn't happen in a vacuum. Many of the algorithms that we're using today in AI were developed 20, 30 years ago. RNNs, CNNs, recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which is pretty much what we use for image video recognition. However, we didn't know how effective these algorithms were in real life. For these algorithms to be tested, we needed computing power. We needed data. And that data came to us thanks to the internet. The internet gave us access to billions and billions of images, for example, to be able to test CNNs. That was something that evolved at the same time as the development of AI. Equally, we needed computing power. And obviously, before these developments, only large organizations would be able to exhibit this type of computing power available to them. Thanks to the cloud, now universities, Individual researchers would be able to contract services, computing power, and limited computing power, pretty much, to be able to test new algorithms. And at the same time, 
a community of developers, an ecosystem that includes not only people developing technology, but also investors, regulators, and all the industries around them. These developments today gave origin to a number of models today that allow us to create new things. And I want to highlight AlphaFold. Google's DeepMind group developed AlphaFold, a program that allows you to design the spatial shape of proteins. And if you have a sequence of amino acids, you need to come up with a way how they're going to configure themselves in space. And that was a difficult problem. People, PhDs, spend a lot of time trying to do so using very sophisticated technologies. Now that's something that can be reduced in time. Now we can actually get that structure in seconds. And the beauty of this development is that we can use that structure to potentially create new medicines. So pretty much you can come out with a special design that you need that is going to be able to attack, let's say, a type of bacteria or a type of virus, and then come out with new drugs. So that's a development that is being open source that now scientists around the world can use. However, the news revolved today about conversational AI. I think we're all excited about the opportunity to create songs, to create poems, to create new stories, to come up with answers to questions that are required before going through Google, to Bing, and then accessing their information. Today, we're using LLMs, large language models. And these models allow us new capabilities. For example, translations. There was a time when translations were not that good as they are today. They were using a different model. And then we would transition to LLMs. We really saw an improvement there. Document summarization, text generation, so many wonderful capabilities are now allowed to us thanks to large language models. And why do we call them large? Because they use a lot of information, a lot of training data to be able to understand languages. Languages are definitely complicated, a human creation. And each of these languages might have 40, 50,000 words. We need to recognize that. But guess what? Computers only understand zeros and ones. So we need to transfer this information into a language that computers can understand. So we create these LLMs that are able to recognize this. If you think about training an LLM, it's like a training a dog to jump, to run, to sit, to slow down. If you think about a model that is going to be helping us in business, like translations, summarizations, we think about fine-tuned models that are built on top of these LLMs. LLMs will help us initially to anticipate what is going to be the next word after this sentence. The cat sat on. There is going to be a distribution that is going to tell us that potential results could be the, a, uh, it. And based on these distributions, we will be able to predict. Now, once you're able to predict one word, this new output becomes part of the input. And then you continue predicting, and so on. So this recurrent process allows you to come up with new stories, with new responses to questions that we never thought a computer would be able to answer. Today, the innovation is not only in us using some of the tools available online, but also through companies leveraging these resources to come up with applications focused on their specific industries. If you call your bank and you have some questions about your bank account, your services, you expect quality of service. However, banks have still a lot of people working in customer service. The expertise provided to you, but the most experienced employee should be the same as the expertise provided by the new one, now using LLMs, a fine-tuned model for them. I am an author. I wrote a couple of books, The Speed Traders and Nightmare on Wall Street. And when you work on a book, you create an outline, you start working on a number of chapters, and then you have to come out with a cover. And this cover, sometimes, it has to be done by a professional illustrator. And that's the process that you go through. So basically, you have an idea based on your writings on how the cover is going to look like, and that's what you share with an illustrator. This is going to be a back and forth, and at the end, we'll get finally to a cover for the book. Today, 
thanks to image generators, I can come up with that cover myself. I don't need to talk to an illustrator. I can try a number of different tools, and I can create a prompt that will reflect my thought about what the cover should look like. And this is something I can do in seconds, in minutes. So that's definitely something that is helping me to become more productive. That is something that is enhancing my professional or impersonal life. How these models are able to create these images? Imagine if you only have two images, the image of the banana and an image of an apple. If you try to create a space that will include these two images, you can come up with a number of features. For example, the shape. The banana is long and the apple is round. You can imagine another feature, color. A banana is typically yellow. An apple is typically red. You can come up with another feature, shininess. An apple is shiny, a banana not so much. So right there you have three potential dimensions that you can use to classify these two images. However, in this world there are billions, trillions of images. How can you classify that? That's what these powerful models are able to do. Not using three dimensions, using hundreds of dimensions that we don't even know of which dimensions are. Yet, they are able to create a multidimensional space that in every point in this space will eventually represent a high-quality image. So once you have a prompt, the prompt is going to help you to identify that point and come up with an image that is pretty much very realistic. That's powerful technology. Last year, November 30th, all of us probably, I mean, all of us like football, right? You like football? I don't hear you. Do you like football? <laughs> of course, we love football. So November 30 last year, we were probably watching the match between Argentina and Poland. They were fighting for the next round in Qatar. Argentina had been defeated by Saudi Arabia. It was shocking. They later went to win the cup, but that was a shocking moment. At that moment, only a few people were following up this development by this very small company, OpenAI. They were releasing a tool called ChatGPT, based on the GPT 3.5 model. And the model initially was released quietly. Not many people knew about it, yet in only a few days, one million people were already using the tool. Today, many months later, of course, almost a year later, now 100 million people cannot live without accessing this tool. And why is that so? Because this tool, now in the version GPT-4, through many different ways to access it, allows us to improve our lives, allows us to come up with some tasks in very easy ways. And that is really making an impact across all companies. Even OpenAI themselves, they are using the tool. Customer service, content moderation, programming. Right out of college, I was a programmer. I was working for a bank in my native Peru. So I was spending countless hours working on coding, maintaining code. Imagine how much help having access to these type of tools could have given me. That would have been a lot of help. And that's what all programmers are doing today, using these tools to facilitate the work they do. And it's really helping them because you can actually save pretty much 50% of your time if you start using these tools. And sometimes the code that is generated by these tools is even better than the coding that programmers will do. So when you think about these type of technologies replacing programmers or replacing people doing these type of activities that have made automatable tasks, let's remember that AI is not going to replace you. Another person using AI might replace you. So that's why it's important for us to think about embracing these technologies coming up. And companies are using that already. Companies are using APIs offered by OpenAI, Anthropic, many different companies to create applications for now. But eventually, these applications will lead to new business models, business models that we are not even of aware of today, or that we cannot even imagine. So this innovation is coming to us. 
It's definitely moving fast, and we need to think about embracing it. We need to think about the possibilities that this technology brings to create the next type of products. For example, if I am a small company and I need to create a promotional video, in a few months or years, I won't need to bring a crew to location to come up with a video for my company. A tool will be able to create a video, perhaps not too long at this moment, but long enough for us to make a great impression to create awareness in my target population. It's a lot of progress. However, we need to ask, will generative AI transform our lives? Will it have really a huge impact in our lives? Yes and no. Can you see these pictures? Do you recognize the American presidents there? Well, we ask AI to generate the pictures of babies. Not any babies, but babies like Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. Do they look okay? We can recognize, right? If you see the picture, you can see that clearly you know who they are. Now, I had to go online and try to find the original, the real pictures of these presidents when they were infants. And you can see right there that the pictures are not the same. You can see right there that there is a difference in how AI reconstructs baby pictures, baby pictures with the way that they were in the past. So while it's true they have some similarities in the beginning, you can see that it's very different. So why is that different? Because these models do not know anything about biology, about anatomy, about the evolution of aging. These models don't know anything about the science behind aging. So there is no way that they're going to predict exactly how these people look when they were babies or how they will look when they age later on. So there is a big difference there. For that, we still don't even know how people age. It all depends on your lifestyle, genetics, what you eat, how you behave, if you smoke or don't smoke. That's going to have a lot of impact. Yet, these models, based on the training data they have, because they have pictures of babies and pictures of adults, they try to create an average proposal of how this person might have looked in the past. And in trying to do so, they show limitations. What is wrong with this image? I don't hear you. Right. <laughs> how many legs you see here? The picture looks very realistic. It looks amazing. Yet it's very easy to see that this model, given that prompt, shows us a person with three legs. And it seems to be the case. People, maybe, maybe you found already, models with three arms, people with six fingers in your hands, things like that. So these easy mistakes are because these models don't really know about biology. They don't know anatomy. So really, there's no guarantee that the picture that you're going to get is going to be what you want. So there are limitations there. Now, think about math. I asked Chad GPT, when he was GPT 3.5, to tell me the numbers, to show me the numbers 1 to 10 using 4 fours. And I assure you, any kid in elementary school we take some time to come up with this challenge and take it on. When I asked this question to ChatGPT, it made mistakes. Only five or six of these answers are correct. All of them are possible, yet they are not correct. So if there's something that these models are good at, it's I'm not saying I don't know. Because these models try to come up with an answer, try to find information in the data set. And in that process, they come up with information that is incorrect. So even a simple calculator can manage these type of operations, like addition, because these are right or wrong answers. So imagine this poor lawyer working for a person from Colombia who happened to have an accident when he was in a plane. He had an injury. One of the cars, the food cars, was not properly secured, so he sued the airline, Avianca. The lawyer prepared a motion in court. And this motion 
<laughs> was prepared using ChatGPT. And this lawyer who wanted to look sophisticated ended up in hot water because many of the cases that were cited in this motion didn't exist. The lawyer went through the motion. The lawyers of the opposing party, Avianca, went through the motion, and they were scratching their heads trying to find these cases. The judge obviously recognized that the lawyer didn't want to deceive the case. The lawyer just didn't know what ChatGPT is all about. So if you're going to start using these type of tools, we need to know that there are limitations. The ChatGPT, as powerful as it is right now, it has basic limitations. It will try to give you a lot of information, but it might hallucinate too. And that is something that we need to be aware of in many important tasks. People talk about emerging abilities. We talk about models that have 150 billion parameters. There is a model pump that had 540 billion parameters. And when we talk about parameters, we are talking about the weights and biases in a model. Those models, of course, will have many billions of parameters. So apparently, the bigger the model, the better. That's not exactly the case. When you think about models that we want them to be usable, we also need to think about models that can be not so heavy that we can use them in our phones and our PCs. Now, some people used to tell us that these models, because they are becoming bigger and better, eventually will exhibit new abilities. For example, people said, look, this model is able to understand a new language that they were not specifically trained for. Guess what? The data that these models had in the training data set already included information in these languages. So the model was able to recognize these type of translations. So it existed there. So when we talk about these emerging abilities, let's remember that's not exactly the case. This model is not sentient. It's not a living thing. What an LLM is doing is really regurgitating words, sentences that are found already in a training data set. That's what they're doing. Yet, these models are so fluent that we're full, that we think that they have life, some intelligence there. Even more so, a Google employee was fired last year because he thought that a model is sentient. A Google engineer with a PhD, you create some attachment with these models. Yet, we need to recognize that they have limitations. We cannot imagine that we can replicate intelligence that took billions of years to develop in only a few years or decades. How long are we in this universe? Life started 4.5 billion years ago. Homo sapiens, 200 to 300,000 years ago. So how can we really think that humanity will be able to create, to replicate that intelligence in only a few years? That's not what's happening. And why? Because these models so far are using only text. Well, video too in some models right now, multimodal models. Yet, these models do not exhibit a model of the world. And why is that important? Because that's what babies, infants exhibit already when they are one year old. That's my baby, Mary. And Mary knows that if she cannot find a toy, it's not because the toy disappeared. It's because the toy must be inside a box, and she will be able to find it there. Mary knows that if I'm going to throw this glass, it's going to fall down because of gravity. So she has a model of the world, and that's going to help her when she tries to understand the world, when she tries to make decisions, when she tries to predict outcomes. And that's what makes us different. That's not what self-driving technology has achieved already. For years, we have predicted, well, people have predicted that self-driving technology is just around the corner. Yet, we still have accidents happening with self-driving technology involved. Why? Because as powerful as these models are, they do not have this model of the world. And it's going to take some time for us to come up with a way for computers to understand the world, something that my cat can do, and something that explains 
that a teenager can learn to drive with only 20 hours of practice. On the other hand, technologies such as self-driving, we have already years trying to train them, to improve them, yet we still have accidents. Why? Because the lack of a world model. That's what is going to make a difference in the future. So self-driving technology, they will tell you, we started with L0, when humans control a vehicle. We need to get to L5, when everything is going to be automated. Yet, we're still not there. So at best, we are at L3, somewhere in the middle. We're going to get there, that is true, but still that's not the case. So it's powerful, it's very exciting, but it also has limitations, and that's what we need to acknowledge. Because intelligence can only emerge if we understand our world. I was telling you about my cat. My cat would be able to jump from one furniture, piece of furniture, to another piece of furniture. How is the cat able to do so? Because the cat has a model of the world. The cat doesn't need to talk to recognize the world, to be able to plan. And that's something that we still need to work on. So in the same way that we're able to manage text today, we'll get to that at some moment. Now, the recent brouhaha about OpenAI, the drama in the last seven days, actually started from this fight. And for me, this is too much ado about nothing. Because people who are excited about technology might tell you that we're close to AGI, when we haven't even seen AGI. We do not exhibit AGI. We only exhibit specific areas where we have a lot of intelligence. On the other hand, we have doomers who say, we're doomed. Humanity is going to end. However, that's not exactly the case. Automobiles were invented in the early 1800s. The first mass production of automobiles started in 1908 with Henry Ford. Do you know when insurance was mandatory in the US? Across all states, only in the 70s. So in the meantime, automobiles didn't kill us all. What is still wrong? So these technologies already advance, and they are not destroying us at all. So when you look at these pictures in movies, stories, science fiction, that the world is coming to an end, well, Hollywood does what it needs to do. They have to sell movies. And that's why we see these type of images, thinking that the world is doomed. But that's not the case. We've been around already for hundreds of thousands of years, and we still have a long way to go to reach even moments when we can think this is going to be the outcome. So that's not the case. We need to be optimistic because technology is moving forward. From the moment humanity invented the wheel, we've seen that this very humble invention transform our lives. We cannot imagine a society today without automobiles. That's something that we cannot even think of. Yet, we see that this very humble invention led to many developments that took us all the way to the moon. So technology's march is irreversible, transforming the world in its wake. Now, you might say, don't we need regulation? Don't we need to keep these people in check? Would that be the message that you would have given to the Wright brothers when they're trying to create the first airplanes? Probably not. Many people wanted to conquer space. They saw birds from Leonardo da Vinci, who made very detailed descriptions of how birds can fly. People always try to create a machine that could fly. That's not the type of thing that the Wright brothers needed back then when they were trying to create this machine. Many people were trying to do so. So if you think about coming up at that moment with regulation for transatlantic flights between Europe and America, you are way too ahead. We didn't know how this technology could have evolved. So there is no way right now to come up with a perfect regulation. So while it's true that we need to guarantee accountability, for example, transparency, for example, it's also true that too much regulation can be counterproductive. So we need to push technology forward. And future AI, 
real AI will definitely make a big improvement for humanity. So people might say, wait, if we have a computer program that is going to reach AGI, it's going to try to dominate the world. If you look at history, intelligence is not correlated with this drive to dominate others. So we shouldn't expect that a technology that might become intelligent in the future will have the same drive. Instead, we should expect, as it's been the case with technology over decades, hundreds of years, that this technology with these AIs will collaborate with humans, not compete. Because we, as humans, will shape their goals. So we will be able to control. So if you think about atomic bombs, for example, back in the 40s, in the 50s, where these bombs were in research, people thought this is going to be the end of the world. Yet, we have been able to control that and to recognize that there is a potential for destruction that can be managed. And that's what we can be optimistic about technology too, about AI. The AI that will really be AI. So if you think about this future AI, we can think about that the world itself is going to be embedded with intelligence. Today, you and I don't even think about electricity because you can plug any device on the wall and you'll find their electricity. You don't need to have your generator at home to be able to enjoy your TV, your smartphone, or your computer. This technology, this electricity, is already there. In the same way, in the near future, intelligence will be embedded around the world. So you will have intelligent chairs, intelligent podiums, intelligent cars, everything. The walls will be intelligent. And not only that, this intelligence will get to know you pretty well. So it will be customized. So whatever you want to do, it will be guessed by this intelligence very effectively. So that's what the future is going to bring us. Now, it's not happening tomorrow. There's still a lot of things that we need to know, yet this intelligence is coming to us. In fact, this technology will be invisible. So you think about today headsets, you think about glasses, you think about this humane AI pin that was released a few weeks ago. Those are all interfaces. But at the end of the day, we won't need those interfaces because these interfaces are only slowing down the connectivity between our brains and the internet, for example. So our brains will be able to communicate with the internet directly without delays. So this intelligence will integrate with natural intelligence, boosting our capabilities. So you might be sitting out there and you might not notice, but the person next to you is a transhuman, a person that has increased abilities thanks to AI. You might see the next person and it might be a robot. You might see the next person and it's going to be a cyborg, a robot with human appearance. That's what we envision in the future. And that's what is going to come to us when this future AI comes. So that AI that we see today depicted in the news, I would really call it only a proto-AI, not exactly the AI that we're going to enjoy probably by the end of the century. Now, AI, of course, it's only the new version of technology. 1.3 million years ago, there was a Sam Alman somewhere explaining humanity, his fellow cavemen, that fire would create unlimited food, unlimited energy. Probably many people were not persuaded, but some people were, and they thought that that was indeed the case. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. Today, 800 million people around the world suffer of poverty. That is a tragedy. So technology can be promising a lot of sudden changes, and that's not exactly what's happening. So the same type of belief that we had in that past can also be translated to today, because Sam Alman, among other techno-optimists today, can also tell us that AI is going to really transform, that access to intelligence will be widely available, that we will have access to energy, and therefore, we will definitely have the secret to well-being for humanity. So those, that's, of course, a big promise. But that's not exactly the case. Because if you look at the evolution of humanity, we, when we compare the intelligence that we have today 
with a cat, that's where we are today. So it's still a very limited form of intelligence. It's not replicating human intelligence yet. We're going to be there, correct, most probably by the end of the century. Yet, at the moment, that's not what we are exhibiting today. And why is that the case? Because there are going to be many things that we need to know. Technology, it's impressive, it's advancing quickly, and it's going to change a lot of things. Technology is going to change the way we live and work, correct. But that's the net effect of technology. It's already happening and it will continue happening. For example, new business models will be created. When people talk about that the AI is going to replace my job, somebody's going to take my position, I can tell you, it's not your position that is at risk. It's some of the activities that you do in your role. So some of them will be replaced by AI. That is true. But that has happened always. It's really what happened with technology. Yet, we still don't know many things. For example, we don't know how intelligence comes. We don't know how our brains work. We don't know many things about our own structure. Excuse me. Excuse me. What are you doing here, Edgar for AI? How did you make it? I couldn't help but overhearing your talk about mankind's efforts to learn more about the human brain. Of course, the human brain is an organ that is key in the development of AI, and we still don't know about it much. You see, most of the current AI systems rely on conventional computing architectures, which are based on the von Neumann model. That means they separate the memory and processing units, and use binary logic and arithmetic operations to manipulate data. But that is not how the brain works. Neuromorphic computing mimics the structure and function of the human brain using neurons and synapses. That is the secret to its intelligence. Can you tell us something about neuromorphic computing, Edgar Perez AI? Of course. Neuromorphic computing aims to emulate the brain's architecture by using electronic devices and circuits that can mimic the behavior and properties of neurons and synapses, such as spiking, plasticity, modulation, etc. Neuromorphic computing also tries to emulate the brain's function by using algorithms and models that can capture the dynamics and principles of neural and synaptic activity. Excellent. Are we close to developing an artificial brain? Well, that is a hard question. There are still many challenges and open questions that need to be addressed before neuromorphic computing can reach human levels. For example, how to design and implement neuromorphic devices and systems that can emulate the complexity, diversity, and dynamics of biological neurons and synapses. How to ensure the reliability, robustness, and safety of these systems, and address the ethical and social implications of their development and deployment. Very good. Neuromorphic computing is not a magic bullet that can solve all the problems of AI, but it is a promising and exciting field that can contribute to the ultimate goal of creating artificial systems that can match or surpass human intelligence. Very nice. Give it up for Edgar for AI, please. I'm not being replaced. AI for AI is enhancing my productivity. So he talks about neuromorphic computing. We can talk about quantum computing. We can talk about photonic computing. So many fields that we still need to develop. So when you think about the development of AI, it's not just one thing that has to go ahead. Technology is not divided into different compartments. It's a whole. And as such, the development of the whole is what will lead us to this artificial general intelligence, whatever concept that might be, because we don't really know what is going to be there. Now, you might say that big companies like Google, Amazon, Meta are the ones that is going to take us there. Well, let's think again. Once upon a time, Amazon was one person. Once upon a time, Google was two people. Once upon a time, Microsoft, two people. So these companies came out from small beginnings and then became giants, providing us with many tools. Today, some, someone in sitting with you might be the next key person leading development of these technologies. AI is great today, but believe me, the future is going to be much, much brighter. There is so much that we still need to know, and that's our role, to learn and to embrace AI. So fear not artificial intelligence, fear natural stupidity. Thank you very much.
for today. Şimdi de küçük bir plaket takdimimiz olacak kendisine ama plate, plaket takdimi için tim yönetim kurulu üyesi Sayın Başaran Bayrağı ben alkışlarınızla sahneye davet edeceğim. Başaran Bey hoş geldiniz. Merhaba. Efendim buyurun. Thank you very much.